This is the Digging for Truth podcast, presented by the Associates for Biblical Research, demonstrating the historical reliability of the Bible through archaeological and biblical research. When David was king of Israel, it says in 1 Chronicles 21 that he took a census of the people, which he wasn't supposed to. As a result, Gad the seer brought a message from God and asked David to choose his punishment. Three years of famine. Three months of being overtaken by the swords of his enemies. Or three days with plague in the land, with the angel of the Lord ravaging every part of Israel with his sword. And then David responds in verse 13, Let me fall into the hands of the Lord, for his mercy is very great. But don't let me fall into human hands. So the Lord sent a plague on Israel, and 70,000 men of Israel fell dead. And God sent an angel to destroy Jerusalem. But as the angel was doing so, the Lord saw it and relented concerning the disaster and said to the angel who was destroying the people, Enough! Withdraw your hand. The angel of the Lord was then standing at the threshing floor of Aruna, the Jebusite. David looked up and saw the angel of the Lord standing between heaven and earth with a drawn sword in his hand extended over Jerusalem. Then David and the elders, clothed in sackcloth, fell face down. Then David said to God, Wasn't it I who ordered the fighting men to be counted? I, the shepherd, have sinned and done wrong. But these sheep, what have they done? Lord my God, let your hand fall on me and my family, but don't let this plague remain on your people. Then the angel of the Lord ordered Gad to tell David to go up and build an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Aruna, the Jebusite. So David went up in obedience to the word that Gad had spoken in the name of the Lord. While Aruna was threshing wheat, he turned and saw the angel. His four sons who were with him hid themselves. Then David approached, and when Aruna looked and saw him, he left the threshing floor and bowed down before David with his face on the ground. So David paid Aruna 600 shekels of gold for the site. David built an altar to the Lord there and sacrificed burnt offerings and fellowship offerings. He called on the Lord, and the Lord answered him with fire from heaven on the altar of burnt offering. Then the Lord spoke to the angel, and he put his sword back into the sheath. And David said, The house of the Lord God is to be here. Those were some selected verses from 1 Chronicles 21. And it's this spot that we're going to be talking about today. We have Henry Smith here and also archaeologist Dr. Scott Stripling. Dr. Stripling is the director of excavations at Shiloh in Israel. And he's been a part of a number of other digs and excavations, including the Temple Mount Sifting Project. So, Scott, we thought we'd have you take us through the history of the Temple Mount and what events took place there and tell us about the structures that have been there through the millennia. And then later we can have you tell us about some of the artifacts and discoveries that are associated with it. I'll try to, re- sure. I'll try to restrain myself a little to allow Luke to engage a little bit more. So, Yeah, would you, would you please some self-restraint? <laughs> You always have these deep theological thoughts that it's like, oh, I didn't even, I, I just enjoy listening to people talk about stuff that uh, I don't know about. And right, so like, right, uh, other than like a clarifying thing, I don't have, like I'm learning. So I don't know how engaging I'll end up being, but maybe to start off before we kind of go through the entire history of the mountain. Why is the Temple Mounts in modern times such a, a, a contested thing? I mean, I feel like Jews can't go there. It's for Muslims only. The, when you're talking about the Temple Mount, the Dome of the Rock, the Al-Aqsa Mosque. And for a long time, I thought the Dome of the Rock was a mosque and it's not. And so mm-hmm. maybe could you explain kind of uh, to set it up our modern context and what is there currently? And then we'll look back at history. Well, that's a good question. Um, with the collapse of the Ottoman Empire um, at the end of World War I, because the Ottomans sided with the Germans and, of course, lost, uh, 400 years of Ottoman uh, control of that part of the world collapsed. And so as a result, the British mandate came into to place. And so the British have control of the land, but they allow Jordan because of the, the religious sensitivities involved of, you know, Muslims uh, being there and it being a Muslim holy site. It's the supposedly the third holiest uh, site in Islam. Haram al-Sharif is the entire Temple Mount uh, area. It has the Dome of the Rock and the Al-Aqsa uh, Mosque on it. 
So when Jordan lost control in 1967 because uh, they attacked Israel, when they lost the Six-Day War, what was negotiated was that Jordan would keep control of the Temple Mount through the Quaff Authority. And so even though you have a modern Jewish state, there are some Christians there, there are obviously Muslims there, Jordan, through the Quaff, still controls, if you will, the Temple Mount. And that's why it's so so problematic right now. Like the destruction of the southeast corner that occurred 17 years ago was to build new ingress and egress into an underground uh, mosque, but it did massive damage to the southeast corner of the of the Temple Mount. So that's that's why it's so contentious. Yeah, that sounds complicated. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So maybe let's, uh, and I'm sure some of those things maybe will become sort of more clear as we discuss the entire history of Mount Moriah, but what's the first event that kind of happened in the Bible that started kind of this whole thing? Well, Abraham takes his son about Moriah, and we have the story in Genesis 22 um, that he takes Isaac, he's going to offer him, and God intervenes at that spot, and Jehovah Jireh is manifested, God provides. For our Muslim friends, of course, the Quran says that it was his son Ishmael, that he was going to to take there. So both faiths through Abraham are tying into the same mountain, and the rock that is the dome of the rock is the rock that both faiths believe that Abraham bound Isaac. And of course, Christians, for the most part, believe the same thing too. And so it's the most disputed real estate on the face of the earth. I mean, goodness knows there's other locations that people could build holy sites, but it's what we call in archaeological terms a timonos. It's a sacred site because God did something there. God showed up on that spot. So is there any, what was Abraham doing in that area? And for, and did he just randomly pick a mountain or does mm. God just come here like, no, go over to this place that I've chosen. Why would God choose this mountain? Uh, maybe we don't know the, you know, just kind of, it just, I've always uh. wondered that what is, what makes this place so special other than something happened there? Or did God pre-choose it? That's going to be a special place. Well, there may be some things, there probably are some things that we don't know what was going on behind the scenes, but the oldest part of Jerusalem is built around the Gihon Spring. And so what we would today, for example, call the city of David was an original Canaanite settlement. This is Melchizedek's Jerusalem. So Mount Moriah is contiguous with Melchizedek's Jerusalem. So from that, that would be the highest point that you would get to. Now, there are mountains that surround Jerusalem, as the Psalms talk about, but uh, from Melchizedek's Jerusalem, this would be the highest point. Maybe it was already, you know, seen as holy in some way, or maybe they just needed to get out of the settlement area for this sacrifice. Okay. So in my mind, I'm imagining when Abraham does this, there's nothing going on there. There's nothing. It's just, he's out in the wilderness. And maybe that's, I mean, when, no, when, did, no. Mal, when did Melchizedek come into the picture? Right. Yeah. So Mel- Melchizedek is in the time of Abraham. So, okay. you know, you're, you're around the year 2000, uh, give, give or take there. So, uh, and we have archeological evidence of that for sure of Jerusalem uh, being occupied in the intermediate bronze age and the middle bronze age. Unfortunately, what happened there in the city of David is that a number of times along the way, people would scrape down to bedrock and then rebuild, you know, building on the bedrock. And so we have pottery and other inscriptions and other evidences um, and even mentions in the ancient literature, Ugaritic literature and later in the the Amarna letters. But... um, sparse archaeological remains from that time because as in many sites they had scraped down to bedrock scott didn't i i read somewhere uh that they found a, in egyptian execration text the mention of jerusalem pretty early 1800 bc yeah is that right uh, do i have that right and ex- yes. execration text tell us what that is they're curses. Curses, um, yeah right right yeah they're they're ancient curse uh, not tablets but texts Usually written on pottery. Mm-hmm. Yeah, good. So so sometimes we've seen claims about Jerusalem not being settled as early as the biblical chronology would indicate, but you just alluded to it's, yeah. it's, it's, and it's been conquered and rebuilt, and we have a modern city there and so on. 
Well, that's right. And the archaeologists who've excavated the city of David, which is, that is the ancient Jerusalem, is what we now call the city of David, like Edli Shukran, for example, Ronnie Reich and others, they would tell you that there's there's pottery all over the place from that time period. It's just not, not normally in a context. Got it. Got it. Remnants then of previous occupation that's been destroyed by subsequent building is what I hear you saying. Good, good. So then the, well, what became the city of David, that becomes this city later that has a king, the king of Jerusalem. What's kind of the next thing that talks about what happened on Mount Moriah, I guess, the the Temple Mount, what became the Temple I mentioned earlier the Gihon Spring, yeah. and what, when David brings the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem, he brings it adjacent to the Gihon Spring, and he pitches a tent there. We did a, a, a Digging for Truth episode uh, about this once, the likely location of the David's Tabernacle. And then there's this fascinating story that we read about in Second Chronicles 21 that you, you had brought up where uh, the angel of the Lord comes and sort of enacting the vengeance of God over some disobedience, he's slaying people in Jerusalem, and it, finally this this comes to an end, and it happens there at the threshing floor of Aruana, and the angel of the Lord appears there, David builds an altar there, and then he purchases that, that, that land from Aruana to build the temple. So now we have a couple of layers. We have the Abraham's miracle that takes place there of Jehovah Jireh. And then we have, again, God's provision, God's mercy is seen on that very spot. So these two together make this a Timonos. And then from time on, everyone is going to want to connect with God at that spot. That's, that's remarkable stuff. I love that. Love those connections. So in the case of Abraham, the hand of death or judgment is withheld from Isaac, right? God stops him from sacrificing Isaac, right? You, you were willing to sacrifice your son to be obedient to me. In the same way, God with, I mean, here is the hand of judgment being withheld in the same exact place. I never thought about that before. Yeah. And as a picture of God's merciful, like he's, he's decreed that this place is a special place of mercy. Because the temple is going to be built there, and the Ark of the Covenant is going to be in this very place where he withholds his hand. Isn't it? That's remarkable. Yeah. That's remarkable. So after this point, you already kind of mentioned it a little bit. So then that's where the temple is going to be built. Can you kind of set up what happens next with David and Solomon and how the first temple right. is built? Well, David is buddies with Hiram of Tyre, and they begin the process of procuring the materials. So the cedars from Lebanon, for example, and things like that. So he's gathering all the materials together, but God is not going to allow David to build the temple because he has blood on his hands. He's a man of war, but it's his son Solomon who's going to have that honor. And so the Bible tells us that in the fourth year of Solomon's reign, 1 Kings 6, 1, that Solomon builds the temple of the Lord. So we would date this to around 966, 967, BC, and using the Assyrian king list, we're able to synchronize and arrive at that date of most likely 967 uh, BC, give or take a, a year or two. And most most scholars would accept that date. So when we begin to then talk about during first period times or second temple period times, it, it begins here. So this is a watershed moment, the building of Solomon's temple. So... This was a really big moment, and I wanted to read a little bit of the narrative. It starts in 2 Chronicles 5, and it says, When all the work Solomon had done for the temple of the Lord was finished, he brought in the things his father had dedicated, the silver and the gold and all the furnishings, and he placed them in the treasuries of God's temple. Then Solomon summoned to Jerusalem the elders of Israel, all the heads of the tribes and the chiefs of the Israelite families to bring the ark of the Lord's covenant from Zion, the city of David. And all the Israelites came together to the king at the time of the festival in the seventh month. When all the elders of Israel had arrived, the Levites took up the ark, and they brought up the ark and the tent of meeting and all the sacred furnishings in it. The Levitical priests carried them up, and King Solomon and the entire assembly of Israel that had gathered with him were there before the ark, sacrificing so many sheep and cattle that they could not be recorded or counted. 
The narrative continues as they bring the ark into the temple and then Solomon speaks and he blesses the people. And then he gives a prayer of dedication that's written for us. And then after that, in chapter seven, it continues and it says, when Solomon finished praying, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. The priests couldn't enter the temple of the Lord because the glory of the Lord filled it. When all the Israelites saw the fire coming down and the glory of the Lord above the temple, they knelt on the pavement with their faces on the ground and worshiped and gave thanks to the Lord saying, he is good, his love endures forever. Then the king and all the people offered sacrifices before the Lord. And King Solomon offered a sacrifice of 22,000 head of cattle and 120,000 sheep and goats. So the king and all the people dedicated the temple of God. And so Scott, you mentioned this, you said that this was called the first temple period. And I think that most people know that this period ended with the destruction of that temple. So can you tell us a little bit about why that happened and what led up to that destruction? Yeah, um, it's the same sad story of apostasy. The Israelites continue to turn their heart away from God. They continue to be involved in idolatry and God allows their enemies, the Babylonians in this case under Nebuchadnezzar, to destroy them. And this is most likely the date is August the 28th, 586, 587 uh, BC. Interesting in the archaeological record, we have something called JPFs or Judite pillar figurines. And there's these little fertility goddesses. And um, we actually have one that came from our, our excavation. But over a thousand of these have been published. They're in all of the stratum up to that point in what we would call the Iron Age II. When they return from the Babylonian captivity, they've still got issues, but idolatry is not one of them. There are no JPFs in the strata after they return from Babylon. That's fascinating. Um, now, I've, I've seen all kinds of stuff. I mean, we have extensive evidence for the destruction of Jerusalem at this time. Yeah. Written records, right? Uh, highlight what you think are the, the coolest or the most interesting things that correlate with the text. Well, uh, Shimon Gibson's uh, dig on Mount Zion is sort of hot off the press. They are, they're uh, revealing evidence of that 587 uh, destruction, and uh, you can see it in the ground there with your own eyes, the, the evidence, the, you know, the pottery, the carbon dating, the destruction level, and so forth. So the Bible says that the Babylonians came, they destroyed uh, Jerusalem, the, the temple is wiped out, and the Israelites are carried away as captives. And so there's no way to put a pretty face on it. It is not good. So you end up with, like, Ezekiel is in Babylon. Jeremiah stays behind with, you know, the people who are still there. But you're now living in under military occupation. Yeah, Daniel, too, right? Around 605, I think, is yeah. deported, right? In the early, before the destruction and the first deportation, if I remember correctly. So a lot going on leading up to that, too. Yeah, uh, I like to say that they took the gifted and talented kids first <laughs> before they took everybody else. <laughs> You know, it's interesting. I've, just a small aside, Scott. I always remember that text where God commands the Israelites to settle down in your cities and do your vocation and have your children, yeah. even though this calamity and catastrophe is happening all around us. A, a little reminder sometimes of how we ought to be thinking in terms of when the world's kind of crumbling around us as Christians. Maybe comment on yeah. that a little bit. Well, I call it living in excellence while in exile. Um, in other words, this is not how I thought my life was going to turn out, where I was going to be at this age and doing this, but this is where I am. And then God shows up and says, okay, where you are, if you'll begin to be fruitful and multiply, I'll give you not only provision, but I'll give you the things that money can't buy, a sense of purpose, of well-being, of destiny, and a future orientation. Yeah, and, and peace in times of chaos, too, yeah. Yeah, right? That internal peace that God gives. I don't know, it's just a reminder, it's such a... Gosh, that's such a, a pedagogical text. You know what I mean? It just mm -hmm. applies to all places and all times for all people that are in the covenant, you know? Uh, yeah. Good stuff. Well, and I know you just we just talked about its destruction, but what did the temple look like? I, it's supposed to be, I mean, really grand, but it was like there are tons of gold inside. Like why would, well, I know they were destroying it because they were just destroying everything, but I'm assuming they carried off plunder and... 
I, I just, I don't always think about how probably lavish the inside of the temple would have looked. Well, it was, it was elaborate, and we do have the descriptions in Chronicles and in Kings. For example, there were 200 pomegranates uh, that adorned Solomon's temple. And uh, the pomegranate being a motif of, of the temple itself and of the presence of God. So, yes, it was intricate. Yes, there was some gold, but it was nothing like the second temple was going to be. Oh, now, okay. of course, the beginning of the second temple, to jump ahead, is quite humble. You know, people are mourning that it doesn't look as good as the first. But over time, as it's remodeled and rebuilt and so forth, it becomes far more elaborate than, than the first temple. So, let's talk about the second temple then. What was... How, when was that one built and it's, yeah, uh, about 516. So if you, if you're going to place the destruction around 586, 587, Jeremiah says there will be 70 years. And so right around 516 is when you have the dedication of the second temple. And yeah, it's, it's humble. And the old timers are just weeping, you know, saying, oh, you know, how, how, how bad this is. And then they have to have a paradigm adjustment that if we'll be faithful in a little, God will entrust us with with much. And uh, over time, of course, you're in a seismic zone there. You have the African and Arabian tectonic plates in the Jordan Valley that are rubbing together, and you periodically have major uh, earthquakes. We're past due for one, by the way, in, in Israel right now. The last ones were in the 1930s, big ones. So, you know, you get the destruction of the temple, but the sacrifice never ceases. So we call it second temple period from that point on, from 516, all the way down to AD 70, even though various temples are built and destructions occur because the sacrifices never cease, except during the Hasmonean period for the three and a half years. I wanted to read a little more here with another narrative that probably isn't read very often. There's a short description of the dedication of the second temple in Ezra 6, but a few chapters before it in Ezra 3, it gives a bit more of an interesting narrative about when they laid the foundations. And starting in verse 7, it says, Then they gave money to the masons and carpenters, and gave food and drink and olive oil to the people of Sidon and Tyre, so that they would bring cedar logs by sea from Lebanon to Joppa, as authorized by Cyrus, king of Persia. In the second month of the second year after their arrival at the house of God in Jerusalem, Zerubbabel, Joshua, and the rest of the people, the priests and the Levites and all who had returned from captivity in Jerusalem, they began to work. When the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests in their vestments and with trumpets and the Levites with cymbals took their places to praise the Lord as prescribed by David King of Israel. With praise and thanksgiving, they sang to the Lord, He is good. His love towards Israel endures forever. And all the people gave a great shout of praise to the Lord, because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But many of the older priests and Levites and family heads who had seen the former temple wept aloud when they saw the foundation of this temple being laid, while many others shouted for joy. No one could distinguish the sounds of the shouts of joy from the sound of weeping, because the people made so much noise, and the sound was heard from far away. I always think of the phase of Herod building the temple, but I haven't thought personally a lot about that intervening period. How much evidence do we have of it expanding? You know, it was the Bulls temple. Like, tell us a little bit more about that intertestamental era too, Scott. Whatever you think is important from that period for us to know. Well, uh, yes. So you have the Hasmonean expansion. They they expand it and make it the Temple Mount larger. It's square. And you can even see the seams on the Temple Mount. And, of course, the definitive work on this is Rittmeyer's uh, book, The Quest. And so the the drawings and the artwork and everything is fantastic. If you take your book, The Quest, with you up on the Temple Mount, you can actually find the seams from the Hasmonean Temple and where then the Herodian Temple expands from there. But let me just real quickly say that we did an episode of Digging for Truth once about this, this theory that the temple was not on the Temple Mount, but it was down in the city of, of David. Uh, they based this on the letter of Aristeus, who's you know mid-first century BC. That's before the Hasmonean um, 
rebuild and expansion. So it's that original humble temple that they're all mourning about when when Aristeas is writing and talking about how grand the Temple Mount is and there's a fountain and people come from all over to see it. That's not at all what the Bible says. The Bible says it was this this pretty wimpy thing until the Hasmoneans expanded and then of course later Herod went uh, went nuclear, so to speak. Now this Aristeas this is a text that's written in that in that period of time and talks about a lot of different things but it it, it, it these things are clear exaggerations you know it's got uh, the jordan river flowing into the mediterranean sea and and things like that but it is the partially the basis where people try to say that the temple was down in in the city of david because yeah aristia says I'm, there's a spring in the in there which there the was a temple mount yeah and you yeah. Can, you can't operate a sacrificial system without a spring of course we know from shiloh <laughs> that's not the case yeah. because the spring is is one kilometer away there but the basis of that idea is that there was a grand temple that Aristeas saw, and that is not what the bible says the bible says that it was this very humble yeah uh structure yeah yeah so then this second temple this is also when the maybe could you talk about a little bit i guess because i don't know very much about it the the maccabean period the maccabean revolt and the rededication and like hanukkah and all that story it's, oh yeah it's that's not great. in the bible well it's not in our bible but it's in isn't it mentioned in the book of maccabees anyway yeah. can you tell about that yeah, it's actually in Hanukkah is talk, talked about in the New Testament in John chapter 10, Jesus celebrates the Feast of Dedication, which the Hebrew word for dedication is Hanukkah. So it's the, it's the Feast of Hanukkah. Uh, yeah, so it's the first temple that Antiochus uh, take on the altar, Antiochus IV, and sets up a statue of himself. And so it's defiled and the, the sacrifices cease once the Maccabean revolt su succeeds and they take control then it's after that point that the Temple Mount is expanded and built out. So that original Hanukkah event is, again, in that very humble uh, first phase one, if you want to say, of the second temple period, phase one temple of the second uh, temple period. The Maccabees then build it out, um, enlarge it make it a square shape. They build the first aqueduct, okay, around the year 100 BC. All the water's down in Bethlehem, okay, still is to this day. So they build an aqueduct that you can see the remnants of today that bring water then for, finally uh, to, to the Temple Mount. Herod, 80 years later, builds a second aqueduct. So you've got an upper and a lower aqueduct. And Wilson's Arch coming onto the Temple Mount today, that's the remains of that, that, that upper um aqueduct that's finally now bringing water to the temple mount but you have in the bowels of the temple mount you have cisterns that are i mean they go on and on there's hundreds of them one of them ripmeyer documents holds 10 million gallons of water <laughs> wow <laughs> i don't think you need a spring <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah so so you're talking millions of gallons of water up on the temple mount easily accessible just in the cistern system alone yeah not to mention the aqueducts coming coming in yeah so, we could probably say a lot more about that uh the thesis that that's down in the city so we'll but we'll refer people to our yeah three-part episodes of Dig digging for truth because we really unpack that together and i i think that's important for people who might be tempted by that idea that that idea is a bad mm -hmm. idea well let's let's talk a little bit more about hanukkah we're on a solar calendar. They were on a lunar calendar. And so Hanukkah and Christmas don't always coincide. Hanukkah takes place on Kislev 25, the 25th day of Kislev, which is the winter month. And it even says that in John chapter 10. And the equivalent of that is December 25th. And so for people who have said, well, you know, they're pagan origins of Christmas and so forth. It, there's there's not a whole lot of evidence of that. You know, the winter solstice is December 21st, not the 25th, as people like to say. And the 25th is, a, is that's the day of the Hanukkah, of the miracle of Hanukkah, of one day's worth of light burning for eight days. And Jesus celebrates it in John chapter 10, where he reveals himself as the light of the world. And they want, you know, they seek to kill him because he's claiming divinity. That's a fascinating connection. Yeah, there's some church fathers too, Tertullian as uh, being one, which is early. Uh, they believe that the conception of Jesus was around March 25th, and therefore mm -hmm. they believe the date, that predating any kind of pagan connection to all those arguments that are out there. I know our episode isn't about that, but but yeah, it is fascinating the Hanukkah connection. You know, I think that's an ignored part of this matrix 
talking about how December 25th became the, the, yeah. the, the day for Christmas. That sounds like another episode. <laughs> well, it is really interesting. And here at our museum at the Bible Seminary, we have a whole section called Hanukkah to Christmas, where we delve into that really deeply. Good stuff. Well, so one question that I've wondered about was, so was the uh, Ark of the Covenant in the temple at this time? Okay, so let's go from the known to the unknown. The okay. Ark of the Covenant is in the first temple, okay, yeah. and uh, there is a quadrangular indentation up on top of that rock that, again, Rittmeyer documents in the traditional location where the Dome of the Rock now covers. And when the second temple is built, we, we don't have any proof that it was. Again, going to Maccabees, which is using Maccabees as the text that tells us about Hanukkah. Very historical book, by the way. The Even Martin Luther and the, the Reformers did had no problem with, with these books. They just called them deuterocanonical or a second level of, of inspiration. But in Maccabees, it tells us that Jeremiah carried the ark across the Jordan River and hid it on Mount Nebo. So, you know, all these episodes and shows about, you know, where's the Ark of the Covenant? Nobody's really explored that one, you know. The caves on Mount Nebo would be fascinating to uh, to explore. So we don't know if it was in the Second Temple or, or not. Okay. So is the Ark of the Covenant no longer mentioned in the Bible after a certain point? Well, no, that's, to my knowledge, until you get to the uh, New Testament, you have the sort of cryptic mentions in the book of Revelation, you know, behold, the, the ark of God was seen in heaven and so forth. So some would believe that, you know, it was literally was taken up into heaven. Um, so the possibilities are that it was in the second temple and it's just not mentioned, or Jeremiah hit it. He hit it really, really good. Uh, I think in the Arch of Titus, when it shows the second temple treasures being carried away to Rome, the menorah and the trumpets, if they had the Ark of the Covenant, I think it would have been depicted on on the Arch of Titus. So tell us a little bit more about that and the the destruction of the second temple, what happened okay. then, and then, yeah, that what this Arch of Titus sounds really interesting. It it happens on the same day. Now, that day is either August the 28th or July the 28th, but it, the, the first temple is destroyed on the same day the second temple is destroyed. And so it's an inescapable sign of God's judgment, you know, over apostasy. So he's allowing them to be trampled by, by the Romans. And so uh, Titus Vespasian, the prince of Rome, you know, completes the destruction that his father uh, Vespasian had begun. And, well, what a fascinating time period. But ultimately... Uh, Titus tells them not to burn the temple. He wants to show what a great city he's conquered. They they leave the three towers, Hippocus, Fasel, and Mariamne standing, and they're going to leave the temple. But by that point, the Roman soldiers themselves are so infuriated with the Jews for, for resisting them uh, because they gave them chance after chance to surrender and gave them terms and they would do it that they do set the temple on fire. And gold being a soft metal it melts then down between the cracks of the stones, and you have a prophecy in Micah, O oh, Zion, you will be plowed with a plow because of your iniquity. And so Josephus tells us that they plowed up the paving stones, the opus sectili stones that we've talked about in the past that we're now finding and documenting. Uh, they plowed them up in order to get the gold. So it's a terrible, terrible time. This is why when you open Matthew, you're under brutal military occupation once you open the New Testament. I mean, at the end of Malachi, the son of righteousness is arising with healing in his wings. I mean, everything's good. And you get into Malachi, and you got big trouble. And this is how it, how it starts. It culminates because of the revolt, the destruction of the second temple, which has never been uh, rebuilt. So you already mentioned the Arch of Titus. So what's on that? And then what they, you said they plowed up the, you know, the gold. Was there any other gold taken away and what oh, yeah. was that used for? And There was so much gold, Luke, that we're, we're told that there was, um, let's see, this is, um, oh, the second century Roman historian Tacitus. Uh, Tacitus tells us that there was a glut on the world market in gold and the prices plummeted because so much was taken from the Jerusalem temple that it caused prices to plummet. They used all that money to build the Colosseum in Rome. 
Wow. As slave labor from Jerusalem and the money from the Jerusalem temple is directly responsible for the erection of the Colosseum in Rome. And to get into the Colosseum, you have to go through the Arch of Titus, which is the victory arch of Titus Vespasian, where it shows and commemorates his destruction of Jerusalem. And that's where you see the Jewish slaves with uh, chains on their ankles, carrying the menorah and the other temple treasures. Sadly, when people go to Rome, you know, and take this this tour, once in a lifetime thing, most tour guides don't even point out that connection. But the destruction of one temple in fulfillment of Jesus's prophecy, I might point out, and the erection of this grand structure have a direct correlation. Boy, and that's what a, what a terrible reversal of the destruction of the dwelling place of Yahweh and is erected basically a pagan entertainment center in which then the covenant people of God are often killed. Yeah. Uh, other types of stuff goes on too, but boy, what a, re- what a reversal, mm. you know, it's, it's a, it's a stark reminder of us to us as we look at history, interpreting it biblically. I mean, we have to, yeah. be, we have to be careful, right? We have to be careful. The, the biblical text is not explicit about that connection, but we know that historically and it's hard not to draw those inferences. Yeah. Well, let me, let me point out a couple of things that maybe most people don't know about after the destruction. The second Jewish revolt from 132 to 136, what we call the Bar Kokhba revolt, Bar Kosiba, Bar Kokhba is actually anointed as Messiah. Uh, by Rabbi Akiva, and um, he has on their coinage is the image of the temple, and so make no mistake about it, the point of the second revolt is to rebuild that temple. Of course, it's brutally crushed. It does not happen, and then Jerusalem is made a total pagan city of Aelia Capitolina at that point. When the Christians finally come to power in the Byzantine period, and they come to Jerusalem, of course, they start building churches. Besides the Holy Sepulchre, the most important church that they build is called the Nea Church, and it's at the end of the Byzantine Cardo, and in many ways, they picture that as the new temple. And uh, there are there is literature that indicates that they had implements of the temple that had been brought back from Rome inside the, the Nea Church. And so, you know, these little nuances of the, the intentions of Bar Kokhba and then how the Byzantines saw the Nea church. Um, and, of course, people have always taken the texts uh, about rebuilding the temple from Ezekiel and um, sort of apocalyptically applied them to our future. And, of course, many, many Christians believe that today, and some Jews as well, that there will be another temple built on the Temple Mount one day. So that's the real quick history. I mean, from Abraham through David and First Temple and Second Temple, and then the, the ripples that came after it, onto what different people may think about the future. So where's the Nea church? I don't know if I've heard of that one. It's at the end of the Byzantine card. It no longer exists, but if ah, you look okay. on the, it was destroyed um, in the Muslim conquest. But uh, if you look on the Madaba map, you'll see it at the end of the Byzantine card where it's depicted. And it was the most prominent church uh, in Jerusalem at that time. Okay. The Byzantines really important uh, Part of history for the for the history of the church, but also site identification, his, history, yeah. events that occurred. Like they didn't always get it right, but boy, they they got a lot of stuff right, and uh, this helps yeah. us. You know, this mosaic of evidence, uh, literally on well, a mosaic. Let me um, refer people to an article that Gary Byers and I wrote a few years ago for Bible and Spade called "Those Indefatigable Byzantines." <laughs> I love that word. <laughs> so when when was the the Byzantine kind of period? When's the beginning ish of that time period? We we date it normally from the Council of Nicaea three twenty five. Okay, and then it goes up through six thirty six with the Muslim conquest at the Battle of the Yarmouk. So from the Battle of the Yarmouk, within one year, the entire land of the Bible falls to to the the first Islamic caliphate. So from 325 to 636 is generally what we refer to, at least in that part of the world, as the Byzantine period. So was there anything constructed on the Temple Mount in between 70 uh, AD and the Byzantine period? Okay, this is a very good question. Uh, yes, there was apparently a church that was erected there, and possibly even a pagan temple. So we know there was a temple of Jupiter uh, built over the place of the Holy Sepulchre, because the Romans are trying to Hellenize this whole place. 
but possibly a temple of Venus had been built on the Temple Mount. But when Helena, Constantine's mother, arrives um, in a, around 320 or so, then um, she, of course, orders these pagan temples to be torn down. And on the Temple Mount, a church or a monastery of some sort is built. And we have a, a literature that indicates this. We also know that when Hamilton in the 1920s um, he was British, and so they he was the most skilled architect at the time. He was allowed access to do repairs from major earthquakes. In the 1920s, there were two major earthquakes in Jerusalem. So Hamilton led the repairs, and so he had access to everything underneath. And he documented the remains of a church underneath there, and uh, but he gave orders not to publish it until after his death because he didn't want to lose access to the Temple Mount. Uh, so it's posthumously published. The Temple Mount sifting project in recent years, through sifting all this southeast corner destruction that occurred, have also found quite a bit of evidence. So, Lean Rittmeyer, build on some of that information on his work? Yeah. Yeah, Lane's the real expert. I mean, I would recommend everybody to get his book, The Quest. Got a great website, too, to learn more about it. So the temple is destroyed in 70 AD. Then there is possibly Roman temple of either Jupiter or Venus. Then there's later a, possibly a Christian church on that same spot. And then later on, then the Byzantines are constructing things. And then you mentioned earlier about the Islamic period. So then, so okay, what happens at, yeah, kind of after all that. All right. To close the loop. So the, the church or monastery that's built on the temple Mount in the time of Helena uh, Helen and Constantine, it stands until the Muslims take control of the Temple Mount. And of course, they tear it down, and in its place, they build the Dome of the Rock. And okay. so, uh, originally, a wooden structure that's built uh, that stands for like one generation, and then they build by before the year 700, they have built the, uh, the permanent structure that is there to this day, which is octagonal. And that is the exact shape of churches all around the Holy Land. You just go right outside Jerusalem on your way to Bethlehem, and you'll come to the Cathisma Church, the ruins of it, and take those dimensions, the octagonal dimensions. It's identical to the Dome of the Rock. So what most people believe, what most scholars hold, is that these were Christian architects at this point. Later, the Muslims became very skilled in, in this type of work, but that they had hired Christians to build this structure, and it's uh, – in the shape of a what a church would have been at that time. And then finally, we should point out that when the Crusaders took control of Jerusalem during for 100 years, that they used the Dome of the Rock, which is built in this octagonal shape, as a church during that time period. Now, they did not tear it down, which is to their credit, because when Saladin reconquers Jerusalem, one of the reasons he gives the Christians passage to Haifa, back to the coast, rather than slaughtering them, it's pretty humane of him, was uh, because they had not destroyed the Dome of the Rock. And then it's converted back into an Islamic structure. So did the Muslims build the Dome of the Rock because of the sacrifice of, that would say, Ishmael, or does it have anything to do with Muhammad? Okay, so the it's because of the sacrifice that it's built on that point, but in the Quran, they believe that Muhammad's night journey uh, occurred. So he leaves on this night journey from Al-Aqsa. Now, Al-Aqsa can be interpreted as the entire Temple Mount area. That's what I would take it to mean. Others would take it to mean the Al-Aqsa Mosque. So either it's from the point of the Dome of the Rock or more likely from on the, the southern area of the Temple Mount today where the Al-Aqsa Mosque is, that that's where Muhammad took his night journey and that's why they built that mosque there. So the Dome of the Rock commemorates Abraham. The Al-Aqsa most likely is commemorating Muhammad's night journey. Okay, a lot of stuff. And, th and there will be a quiz for the listeners after this, okay? <laughs> but the okay, so that kind of gives us the somewhat abbreviated history of the Temple Mount of about 3,000 years from the time of Abraham sacrificing Isaac to both Jewish temples and then through the Roman and Byzantine and Muslim periods up onto the Crusades. So let's shift a little bit more into some of the archaeology and artifacts associated with the Temple Mount. Okay. There's an ancient scroll that was discovered called the Copper Scroll, and I actually got to see it once, and I thought it was pretty cool. Mm. Scott, do you know anything about that, and can you tell us about it? 
the Copper Scroll is one of the Dead Sea Scrolls, and it's in Amman, Jordan, in the New Archaeological Museum there. And yes, it does does purport to give a essentially a treasure map to the uh, uh, temple treasures. And it's cryptic. It could be read a lot of different ways. Sound familiar? Um, and so some people believe that it you know leads them to places like Harkania down in the Judean wilderness. Um, um, there has been talk in recent years that perhaps treasures were buried at Qumran. Uh, so people have been all over the map literally with it. But yes, that is what it seems to say, that it is a treasure map from the first century. So is it reporting on the treasures that were in the second temple, not the first yes. temple? Okay, second temple. That's right. Now, interestingly, this this could... Well, it would have predated because Qumran was destroyed in the year 68, AD 68. And then when the Romans destroyed Jerusalem, whatever treasures are there, they do take. And we see those on the Arch of Titus. But perhaps some had been hidden uh, before that, and maybe that's what the Copper Scroll is indicating. It's very cryptic. Uh, we as archaeologists do not like to be labeled as treasure hunters, <laughs> so we sort of shy away from that. But could there be some validity to it? It's certainly possible. So if you take it literally or more literally, it's a treasure map. If it's uh, figurative, who knows? And then it all could be just one long-winded practical joke on us living 2,000 years later. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> To think the Essenes, if they're the ones who wrote it, had that much of a sense of humor. That's that's mind boggling. Um, I, a student of mine, Shelly uh, Shelly Niece, um, actually wrote a best selling book called The Copper Scroll that hmm. uh, people might find interesting. Uh, she's basically following the story of uh, of a person who claims that all this stuff is buried at Qumran. I don't personally. You know, believe that that theory, but I have to say, my student wrote a really good book. She's a very good writer. Excellent. Oh, interesting. But just the fact that it's written on copper and not papyrus yeah, makes it makes it extremely rare. So, Scott, I remember a few years ago we had a gentleman on our staff for doing a later period pottery, Perez Ruven, and he helped us with analysis of early Roman pottery, time of Jesus. But he had done some research on some beams. Right. On the Temple Mount. Tell us about these wooden beams and their connection to the temple and give, give us that story. So uh, Pettit's actual main expertise is the Islamic period. He also was an expert in Hellenistic and Roman pottery, but mainly the Islamic period. So, yeah, he had published an article in BAR um, on the beams of the Temple Mount, the beams of Herod's Temple. So people should be able to access that pretty easily. Um, the carbon dating done on those those beams indicated that they dated back to the time of the Second Temple, and some of them even as far back as the First Temple. So these beams, as long as they're kept dry, I mean, they, they'll just last for thousands of years and can be reused. So some of them are still sitting around outside the Al-Aqsa today. I've seen some of them that are in storage. I've been able to examine them as well. Some of them have like Islamic inscriptions on them. And also Pettit has published, um, there's a mosque in Hebron that has um, an Islamic, an Arabic inscription that refers to the Temple Mount as the house of God. Al Magdais, I think, is the, the term that is used. But anyway, it connects and proves that early Islamic followers believed that the Jewish temple once stood on the Temple Mount as well. Fascinating. Those those temple beams just that's it's I just find that intriguing every time the subject comes up. Well, and then the floors. So it's not only the, the the beams, but then we have a member of our team, Frankie Snyder, who has published the the flooring, the opusectomy. Here she cracked the code, a math teacher, and she cracked the geometric code for all these tiles of what Josephus called opus sectili. And so Frankie's now publishing all this stuff. And so we're learning more than we've ever known about the temple. We know architecturally from Rittmeyer's work. We know from the flooring from Frankie Snyder's work. We know about the roofing from Pettit's Ruven. So this is a really exciting time that we're living in. Yeah, it seems remarkable to me. <laughs> You've said this, we joke all the time about the, uh, you know, where there's two archaeologists, there's three opinions. Mm -hmm. But archaeologists all agree about the Temple Mount. Right. That's the one point of agreement that we have with all archaeologists. If, if you could poll Israeli archaeologists, we'd they'd fight with each other and with us about anything. A fight, I mean, 
disagreement, yeah. right? But on this question, it's irrefutable. It's so interesting. Yeah, yeah. not a single archaeologist would think that the temple was anywhere other than on the Temple Mount where the Dome of the Rock currently stands. Yeah, yeah. In a little bit, uh, I want to ask you about kind of your involvement with the Temple Mount sifting project and stuff like that. But before we get to that, can you talk about, isn't there like some sort of cave underneath? So in, the Dome of the Rock is over the with the foundation stone. I've read some stuff online about what some people are, it's, I think it's Jews that claim that the foundation stone is where God started creating the earth mm. and it was, that's where maybe the garden of Eden was. Have, have you mm. read any of that kind of stuff or know anything about that? Yeah, that's an alternate rabbinic tradition that a creation actually occurred there. And it's partially supported by the Gihon spring because remember in Genesis, the four rivers, yeah, yeah. one of one of them was Gihon. Okay. And so here you have the Gihon spring uh, right there. And so sort of leads some, lends some credence to that idea that creation actually God creates man on this spot as well. Uh, it is a later rabbinic tradition, but uh, yes, there are certainly people who who hold to that. Is that why they call it the foundation stone? Because it's the foundation of the I, earth? I, I believe so, yes. And then I've seen pictures online, but there's a cave underneath right. the foundation stone. There's steps going down. What's that used for? And has anyone found the Ark of the Covenant down there? Because I hear people say that <laughs> that's where it's hidden. No, no, it's a very simple cave. You just walk down a few steps and you're there. Um, I was recently again in be able to go inside the Dome of the Rock. I had not been there since 1999, but this last summer um, was able to to go again. And um, yeah, so I was in that cave. So no, def definitely no Ark of the Covenant there. <laughs> so you can Google it and there's pictures of like, you know, car oh, yeah. carpets on the walls. And I've seen people call it the Well of Souls. And I don't know if that's because... Did they watch Indiana Jones or if that came first or did Indiana Jones steal <laughs> that from that? No, no, no. That is definitely what they call it is the well of souls. Okay. Yeah. Do you know why they call it that? <laughs> uh, not off the top of my head. Okay. <laughs> There's just so many things, bits and pieces like Ark of the Covenant stuff. Like I just, you know, you hear all this stuff from Indiana Jones that is that, did they make that up? Did they steal that from something? Is that partially true? Or is that just conspiracy? Is that something yeah. else? And it like, it's so hard to discern the truth. Yeah, we have access. Yeah. We have access to more information and misinformation than any people in human history, and so <laughs> you would right. think that more information would be more helpful. But in actually, in a lot of ways, it's detrimental. You know, yeah, it's part of what we're trying to do is help people try to get to. Okay, these are the things that we can confidently say. These other things can be very speculative, and we've got to be really careful uh, about it. And yeah. that's part of what we want to try to do as ministry and in, in guiding people in the church first, and then also others who might be sincerely seeking truth. Yeah. You mentioned a little earlier about the repair work that happened kind of illegally. Could you tell us a little bit about what that was and then what led to the Temple Mount sifting project? Uh, I think it was 17 years ago, the Quaff authority ordered the removal of about 40 tons of archeological material from the South uh, east corner of the Temple Mount to create new staircases into an underground mosque called Solomon Stables. It's actually not from the time of Solomon, but it was a fire hazard, the narrow staircases that they had. Instead of calling an archaeologist who would have loved the opportunity to have excavated on the Temple Mount, instead they just took heavy equipment and ripped it out of context and dumped it into the Kidron Valley. And so Zaki Swig and uh, Gabby Barkai were eventually I'm making a long story short. Uh, we're eventually able to get a license to relocate those piles to the Sudim Valley on the Mount of Olives and to begin to sift it. They decided to, some, uh, some of it was sort of clay, sticky, to experiment with water and uh, wash it. They saw what a big difference that made. And so wet sifting entered into its modern you know, era with that. They began to then dry sift and wet sift. I then early on became a supervisor on that project uh, for two years. And that's where I became a big believer in wet sifting because I could see that things, if we weren't doing it, what we were throwing away. And I thought, wow, we must be doing that on our dig too. And all digs must be doing this. And Herschel Shanks, at the time, the editor of BAR, to his credit, started beating a drum. We've got to start wet sifting. Let's get the dump piles from Megiddo and wet sift them and so forth. So we took that seriously. And with our experience, uh, me and Frankie Snyder, who then later would join our staff, she was a staff member there. Many people like Abigail and Ellen and others got experience in wet sifting early on working on 
on that project. And then we were able to, of course, put it into the field at Shiloh where it's revolutionary. Yeah, it's remarkable to me. Another another story of God's providence. This That should have never happened. Yeah. Should have never, ever happened. But it did happen. So it was taken for good. And that idea was planted in your mind as an archaeologist. I'm going to do this if I'm ever in charge of an excavation and I have access to water. And that's exactly what we've done at Shiloh. And we've yeah. discovered things at Shiloh that we wouldn't have found, oh, prob- probably, yeah. right, if you hadn't had that experience from something. It reminds me of Genesis 50, what God, what man meant for evil, God does yeah. meant for good. You know, like I'm using my sanctified imagination a little bit, but really— Right, we wouldn't be talking about some of the things. So it's it's so interesting to see the hand of yeah. our Lord in all things. Right? Yeah, absolutely. So as as a result of that wet sifting, what things were found, and what time periods were they from? What evidence does it provide of the temple? And I think you already started to mention the the floor tiles. Can you talk about the things that were found? Okay, so they have found tens of thousands of things. Okay, coins, fragments of statuary, mosaic tiles, pottery from all time periods. For the most part, they're getting small pieces. So that actually then like made Frankie an expert in small finds because you have to be able to identify the whole thing from just a a small piece of it. But yeah, from all the different time periods, unfortunately it was out of context. But if you find a stone vessel cup, like what we call a mug, we already know from the archeological record that they appear about 75 BC or something like that, stone vessels appear in the archaeological record, and then they disappear for the most part at AD 70. So it's just a window of about 140 years. So even though that stuff was out of context, using our larger understanding of stratigraphy, we could sort of recreate stratigraphically what it was like. And if you get an important in- inscription of some kind, even if it's not in context, it can still still be helpful to you. Sometimes you recover half of an inscription. Maybe you found half of it in context, and now you find the other half out of context. Well, you can reunite the two. But methodologically, I think the biggest contribution has been uh, those that opus sectile tiles that I mentioned earlier and then how it motivated people like me to say, you know, we're going to take this to the field and do it in situ. And, of course, this has been a game changer for us at Shiloh and also in our project at Mount Eval. So how many tile pieces were found in order? Yeah, they're marble. Um, marble, okay. Yeah, so it's very, very fine stone that's been cut, imported, cut, and uh, they're geometric design. So I would say about 200, but you know, I could be off a little bit. But uh, Frankie was able to take geometry and take those tiles and crack the code, and now everyone agrees with her that you know, indeed, that's the flooring from the the second temple. Wow. Yeah, pretty awesome. It is. Yeah, it really is. So. Last question, Scott, is uh, why is the Temple Mount important to Christians? There's a important quasi-loaded question in some ways, depending on your views of eschatology. Mm-hmm. But, but uh, eschatology aside, perhaps, give us your thoughts on the importance of the Temple Mount. Well, God sent his son into a context when he sent Jesus. There was It was called late Second Temple period Judaism. Jesus was born a Jew. He lived as a Jew. He celebrated the Jewish festivals. And I cited earlier John chapter 10 where he's on the Temple Mount uh, celebrating Hanukkah when he gives this, this great teaching. So either we have a historical Hebrew Bible or we don't. And so when the Bible is telling us that in a certain time period, there was a sacrificial system, there was a destruction that took place, and we see the synchronization between the biblical text and the archaeological data, as a Christian, then it becomes very important to me because there is a historicity to my faith. And then when I look at the Temple Mount, even today, for example, and I continue to see evidence that the Bible is a reliable historical source, then I think that that's very important for me from a faith faith standpoint, that we're not dealing with mythology, like the letter of Aristeus. We're not just making up details about the Temple Mount, but we can verify these things archaeologically. Amen to that. Has God spoken? We believe the answer is yes. And the archaeology is consistent with that claim. Yeah. 
Pretty simple syllogism, right? Complicated yep. evidence, complicated discussions, right? Contentious sometimes, uh, complex, incomplete data, but nonetheless, we have very solid reasons to believe, as it were. Yeah, very good. Well, I think that's probably a good place to stop for us. Of course, we kind of just gave an overview of a lot of stuff, and there's always more out there that you can read about. So we'll put a couple links in the show notes for if you want to read more. But that's all we have for today. Until next time. Digging for Truth is a presentation of the Associates for Biblical Research. To find out more about ABR, just go to BibleArchaeology.org.